Great to see you this weekend, Grace. I am so glad to be with you, and I'm excited for this really important series that we're going to have over the next few weekends here. But before we get into that, uh, between the last time I saw you from stage and this time, a uh, significant event in Kelly and I's life as we dropped off our oldest about 2,000 miles away at college. And I just say that uh, because here's one thing I really do appreciate that I want you to know. Um, I love when you guys actually treat me like a people and a person and not a superhuman. And I'm really grateful, I mean this very sincerely, that many of you have been very conscious over the last few weeks to say, how are you and Kelly doing? And, um, and I just, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful uh, that while it is a big church, there's not some kind of distance that people think they can't ask me those kind of things when they see me personally or even engage me in social media. And so thank you. Uh, we are doing well, uh, as well as we can be doing for sending someone 2,000 miles away and hoping he goes to class, right? And doing all those things. <laughs> But uh, I really do appreciate that and am excited for uh, my oldest and his journey as he's out in Arizona. Uh, this conversation that we're about to have over the next few weekends, and, and please note this, that we, we call these conversations here because they're bigger than just the weekends. These, these things that we talk about here at Grace ultimately find themselves in small groups and in other environments where we're talking about these things for several weeks over different uh, days of the week. And so this series is a series that's at the core. It's at the very essence of what it means to be a Jesus-centered person. It's at the core of what it means to be a Christian. This series is plain and simple. It's a discipleship or oriented series. If you are a Christian, it's gonna force you to put a mirror up to yourself and say, how do I feel about this stuff? What do I believe about this stuff? Am I excited about these concepts and truths and these realities and how they really play a part in the Christian experience? And so it's a big deal for Christians to ask ourselves these questions over the course of the next few weeks. But also, if you're not a Christian, that you are invited to understand what Christians believe about the God in heaven, what Christians believe about the mission God has called Christians to be on, what Christians believe about what God is doing all over the earth. And you're invited to know that God, follow that God, connect with that God, and to join in the mission that God has invited us to. And so whether you're a Christian or not, it's valuable for you to lean in and listen to what is going on. Now, over the course of this series, what you'll notice is it is really connected to something that we've been talking about a lot this year. If you've been paying attention to Grace and our sermon series and the things that we've been talking about over and over, we've been giving much attention to this particular idea that we laid out at the beginning of the year. And we laid out that we, we really felt like we were at risk of our church atrophying an important focus, an important mindset, an important muscle which is this idea that we've talked about of external and eternal eyes. And so this is what we've really been talking about over the course of the year in lots of different ways, that we as Christians and we as a church, as Grace Fellowship, do we get to fix our eyes focused externally and eternally, that we as a church get to think about how do we really look outside of ourselves at the natural orientation, the natural inertia of any organization, any person, any company is to begin to look internal and not external. And we said, that's wrong. We need to make sure that we don't become just like a holy huddle that's focused on us and our ways and our thoughts, that we're really thinking externally and not just externally, not just thinking about people that are not yet Christians or are not part of our church, but we're thinking eternally, that we really have a gospel-minded urgency to think about the big picture of life, what really, really matters. I mean, there's a reality, and, and I know, and some of you, you'll send me an email about this, even after I say this, okay? Like, I know that for some of you, like, what happens in November is a really big deal, and I'm not saying it's not a big deal. What I'm saying is it's not a big deal in the scope of eternity. And there are many of us that we, we have to learn to go. What matters to me a lot right now, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm not saying it's not a big deal. I'm not saying it's not significant. What I'm saying is it's not eternal, and we have to learn to think externally and eternally. So we've been talking about that over and over in different ways. And we said one of the privileges as Christians is we get to, we don't have to, we get to be ambassadors for Jesus. We get to connect people to the good news of Jesus. We get to tell people about the hope of glory that is the person of Jesus Christ. And so if you've been paying attention, there's a bunch of things we've done around that. 
We, we did the series, Get To, and in that series, we talked about praying for two people every day at two o'clock, and we, we asked everybody to, to read a book, this book that talked about three circles and sin and salvation and all these things and how you share the gospel and take everyday conversations and make them meaningful. Those of you that are partners, you know that our partner gathering this year, we, we talked about a book that was about how we see work in the lens of mission, and we think eternally and externally, even in our jobs. We, we did the multiplication project where we asked people from campuses to come up and take money, and, and that while that's not necessarily uh, evangelistic to share our faith, it gets our eyes off of ourselves. We had explore groups where people were able to come and talk about their faith. And some of those people ended up getting baptized and meeting Jesus. And other people are still processing what's going on. We've got some things moving forward, even something in this series that we'll talk about that is part of this external and eternal eyes reality. We've, we've got a weekend coming up in, a, in about a month and a half that's important for us as we're processing all of these things. And so we're going to continue to navigate this reality. And this series is just like, it's in the center of that. It's, it's about that. It's, it's about this eternal and external eyes thing. Now, this is one of those series that it's like one long sermon. All right. So, so this weekend, like I do the intro and I do kind of the beginning part and I lay a foundation, but I recognize that every campus, when you leave this weekend, it'll feel very incomplete. It'll feel like I didn't answer a bunch of questions. It'll feel like I didn't solve all your problems. I don't even necessarily tell you what to do with it. But it's just a truth that we've got to start with and we've got to understand. Now, if you don't have kids and then you go around kids and you, you, maybe you babysit or maybe you have nieces or nephews or whatever, you're reminded of like, oh, kids say certain things or they do certain things. And when you're a parent, those kids start out doing that stuff and then you, they get older and they start to do different things. And sometimes you forget that they used to do those things. Well, not long ago, I was hanging out with some, a three-year-old and a four-year-old and, and those, the three-year-old and the four-year-old were saying something that I was like, oh yeah, I remember when my kids used to say this all the time. And, and the thing that they would say was pretty much no matter what you said to them, you would tell them something, you would ask them to do something, you would comment on something and they would say, Why? 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 And they're three, they're four, you can't even play the because I said so thing, right? You just, sometimes even because I said so didn't make sense, but they're, they're always like, why? Why? What, what's going on? I want to understand. And that makes a lot of sense, to be honest. Where their brains are and where they are in the process, they want to know, they want to understand, they want to, they want to make sure. I mean, I, I don't remember what it's like to be three, but, but I can actually kind of think back and sympathize and go, man, there's a lot of big people asking me to do things that I have no idea why. They're telling me to do things I have no idea why. Now, what happens is, if we're honest, is that as your kids get a little bit older and they get into grade school and then they become adolescents, they still have the why question. They don't always verbalize it the same way, but it's still internal in there. And then as they turn into teenagers and they turn into young adults, they still have the why question. Sometimes they ask. Sometimes when they really want to do something, they'll press on and they'll say why. But, but let's go beyond three-year-olds and four-year-olds and even 18-year-olds. And let's just recognize that for all of us, we like to know the why. Come on, you, you've been told to do something at work. And in your soul, you're like, this is stupid. Why? You, you, you've been told to do something by your spouse. And in your soul, you're like, this is dumb, why? If you're a parent of a kid in a school district, they've sent you papers home and you've said, why? There's times where there's a policy that comes out at work and you're like, why? I don't, I don't understand it. And yet, if we have a conversation sometimes and we're able to link the why to the what's being asked and those things connect, there's like a light bulb that goes off. There's something that's really powerful. In fact, let, let's, let's think about it this way. That when we understand there is an incredible power in understanding a why that drives a what. When we really understand a why that drives a what. So again, whether it's a parent, a boss, a coach, an organization, or a policy that says don't do that or do do this. And you're like, why? And then you hear the why. You're like, oh, I understand why we should do that drill at practice, coach. I understand why we should fill out those reports, boss. I understand why curfew does matter, mom and dad. I might not like it, but I understand the why. I understand the why you're asking me to do that at church. I understand why that is happening in our city. And when you understand the why, the what begins to make a lot more sense. And for many of us in a conversation about God and the ends of the earth, what a lot of people start with and focus on is the what. 
and they miss the why. They miss the why this conversation even matters. And what I want to do for a, a few moments is to really drive at the why and to think about why does this whole thing matter for the church, the big capital C church? Why does it matter for our church? Why does it matter for individual Christians? If you're not a Christian, why is it we think it's such a big deal? What is underneath all of this? And, and to do this this weekend, I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to I'm going to go to a bunch of different scriptures, and it, it's a little bit a different weekend where we're going to kind of jump around, and there's going to be a lot of verses. I'm going to read a lot of scripture, um, and you can just write these down. You don't got to go there, but, but what I want to do is I want to start at the beginning of the Bible, and then I want to go to the end of the Bible, and I want to show you what was a promise from God, and then I want to show you a picture at the end. And so God, very near the beginning of the Bible, as he's revealing history, as the Bible is beginning to tell us about what God's going to do, he, he tells us something in Genesis chapter 12 that many of us know, many of us heard, we've taught this many times at Grace. And, and this is what God tells to a guy named Abram that he's gonna make Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. So he says, you're gonna leave, you're gonna go to a land. I'm not telling you what that is yet, but you're gonna go to it. And I will make you into a great nation. I'm gonna make you into something and I'll bless you. And I'll make your name great and I'll be a blessing. And again, we've taught on this. You can find lots of messages we've done on this here at Grace. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This is the promise that God lays out. Like, like God in Genesis 3, everything goes wrong. Adam and Eve sinned, separation between God and man Things are terrible. God makes a promise. I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to come back. I'm going to bring you back in a relationship. The gospel, listen to me, the gospel is not just the plan of salvation that Jesus died for you need to receive it. The gospel is the good news that there's a God who loves you and wants a relationship with you. That began before Jesus came to earth. That's always been true. And in the gospel story, God says, I'm going to make a way. And what he starts to do to make a way is he calls Abram. And he says, Abram, here's the promise that I want you to know. Someday, all of the world will be blessed through what you're about to do. That's the promise of Genesis. Then we, we see this and we sometimes read this next part and we go, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. But we need to see this promise is going to turn into this picture. This is in Revelation chapter 7, end of the Bible, last book. After this, John is having this revelation from God. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From where? What are these two words, church? What is it? From every nation. What was the promise? I'll bless the whole earth. And John, what he sees at the end is that there's a multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And they're standing before the throne. And they're standing before the Lamb. And they're wearing robes. And they're holding palm branches in their hands. And then the passage keeps going as it moves on. And it tells us what they're doing. And they carried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worship saying amen praise and glory and wisdom thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever amen it's this worship moment that we see that is going on with God and these creatures and the people from all over the world and what what John saw was what was promised to Abraham happens that listen the trajectory of human history is that God is going to redeem people from all of the earth. And all of those people someday will be before God and they will worship God and they will bow their knee before God and they will praise God and they will adore God. And God has said between now and then, what I'm about is getting as many of them as possible. He promised it would happen. And the picture at the end is it does. And what this is showing us, and man, if we could take the time, we could spend hours and just go cover to cover to cover to cover. And of the, cover to cover the Bible, here's what you'd see after verse after verse after verse, is that there's something inside the heart of God. And here is the why we have to understand this call of the ends of the earth. This is what you need to know about God. It's that God is for, go ahead, go to the, the note. God is for and over all of the world. He's for, he's over the nations, and he's for the nations. God is for the nations and he's over the nations. You gotta understand both of these. He's over them and he's for them. He's for them and he's over them. God is over the nations in that he is the ruler of all nations. And we'll look at this here in a second. 
that God is in charge. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is why I get so fired up about this when we talk about this sometimes in our culture. God is not the God of the United States of America. He's the God of the world. He's the God of every tribe, of every tongue. He rules and reigns in all times, in all places, in all spaces. He is in charge and sovereign in God in every spot in all creation. There's nowhere where God doesn't rule and reign. And in every single tribe, tongue, and nation, God is over them and he is in charge. And he wants them. He's for them. He's like, listen, whatever's in your culture, whatever's in your world that you think is best, I'm better. Whatever you think is good, I'm better. Whatever you think will set you free, I will set you free. Whatever you really think is blessed and abundant, it's for me. God is over the nations. He's in charge. He's in control. He's to be worshiped. But he also is for them. He wants a relationship with them. Now, again, I could show you this all over the place in the Bible, but I just want to show it to you in three different places in the book of Psalms. Okay, three different places in the book of Psalms. The first one is in Psalm 67. Psalm 67, the beginning of it says this. And this, again, these are just examples of where I could go to over and over and over. And we're going to read a bunch of it. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. So that God, your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The psalmist continues in verse four. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Like, like do, we, do we start to see the picture that God's like, I'm over them. I rule, I'm in charge, but I am for them. I want them to know me. I want them to experience salvation through me. This is another Psalm that, that shows us, Psalm 86. Among the gods, there is none like you. We know there's other people that are saying there's real gods. We know that there's other people saying there's real truth. But among all those titles and names, there is no God like you, Lord, no deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. He's declaring the psalmist is that, that of all the gods that exist, whether it's in Africa or Asia, or whether it's in South America or Europe or it's some other corner of America, all those gods, if they're not God of scripture, Jesus, they're false. There's one God. And that, that God is over all nations and he is for all nations and he wants to have glory brought to himself through those nations. One more psalm that just demonstrates this. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord. Who, who? All earth. Everybody. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. I, I've just pulled up three Psalms and I could do this literally for hours. That the Bible over and over from beginning to end is the promise that God will reach the world to the picture that he's reached the world. And in between, he's like, I'm in charge. I'm over. I'm in control. They should worship me. They should follow me. I'm over every nation. And I am for every nation that they would be reached. I'm just, I'm just going to pause here and, and then, then I'll move on. Don't, don't answer out loud. Do you care that God wants to reach the world? Not, not intellectually, it's a great idea. I am for it in theory. Of course I am for God reaching more of the world than not reaching more of the world. No, no, no. Do you care that it's impacting your life? They're like, like, it doesn't take me coming up here, preaching, and you going, 
The God that I worship is the God of the world, and he wants every tribe, every tongue, every nation to know him, and that's where history is going, and I want in on that. And so what God has done is he said, I'm gonna do that, and I have a unique way that I'm gonna do it. I'm, I'm gonna call a, a, a specific people to myself, and those people will represent me. And when people see those people and they see the way they live and they see the God that they worship, they see the blessing that comes, they see the goodness and fruit of that God, those people will say, hey, what's that about? Who's it you follow? Who's it that you worship? Who's it that you're after? I am interested in that. And so God says, the why I would have those people is I am over and for all nations. I am for the world. My heart is for the world. And part of his mechanism to do that is he leaves people. We, we see this in the Old Testament, right? This is what he was even referring to in Genesis 12. He was gonna build the nation of Israel. And what was the nation of Israel supposed to be? They were supposed to be a beacon. They were supposed to be a city on a hill. They were supposed to be a light that people would see them and they would go, oh, that's what God's like. I wanna know that God. I wanna follow that God. In fact, we would say it this way, that the heart of God on display is that God's plan has always used specific people to proclaim the global invitation. This is the way that it's worked. That God has always used specific people that would be a city on a hill, that would be a light, that would embody his truth, that they would be the people that would proclaim the global invitation that God is over and for the nations. Again, this was in the Old Testament, specifically the nation of Israel. And God called them and he gave them a covenant and he made, you be my God, I'll, you, you be my people, I'll be your God. You obey me, we'll be blessed. Let's, let's, let's do this, let's make this go. And there's actually a really cool story about how this like news got out in the world. We, we don't know how it exactly got out, but there was this one particular ruler who ruled in, uh, in Southwestern Arabia and her name was the Queen of Sheba. And some of you have heard about her and through other writings and other things, but the Queen of Sheba shows up and she goes to the nation of Israel and we actually find out what happens when she goes in 1 Kings. And it says this in the story in 1 Kings chapter 10. When the Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship with the Lord. Just process that for a second. The Queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon, but not just the fame of Solomon, that he was in relationship with Jehovah God. When she heard about that, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan with camels carrying spices, large quantities of gold and precious stones. By the way, these details are one of the reasons I believe the Bible's true. Like, why would you just put this filler in there? I mean, it's telling us like what they brought with them. And she came to Solomon and she talked with him about all that she had in her mind. So she shows up and she's like, I heard you're smart and I heard your God is real. Let's talk. Let's have coffee. So then the story continues to unfold and it says this, Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for this king to explain to her. Why was nothing too hard? Because Solomon was wise. Why was Solomon wise? Because God said, I'll give you anything. And God said, Solomon said, I want wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. And so now this man who's blessed by God is meeting with this woman and she's amazed at his intelligence. When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon in the palace he had built, the food on the table, the seating of the officials, the attending servants in their robes, the cupbearers, the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she was overwhelmed. She's like, holy cow, this is impressive. Maybe the, maybe the rumors about you and about this God are true. Look as the story continues to unfold. She said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your achievements and about your wisdom is true. But I did not believe these things until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half of what was told to me in wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report I heard. And then ready? Here's how she's gonna respond to it as she keeps going. Here's, here's what it says. How happy your people must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Praise be to the Lord your God. She heard about the report, city on a hill, light of the people. She comes and she sees it and she's like, I don't have any other answer other than praise be to your God. Who has enlightened you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Why? Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king to maintain justice and righteousness. This is one example 
We could go through the Old Testament and we would see the nation of Israel, city on a hill, used by God so that people would show up and they would go, oh, Jehovah God is real. God's plan to reach the nations because he's over and for the nations has always included a group of people that were called out and sent out to go make a difference. And we're seeing that here, which brings us to us. Which brings us to us. Because what was the promise that God would reach the entire world? What was the, the picture that we see? He reaches the entire world. In between there, he's coming to get people. Who are the people that he's using to go get the people now? Us. Who, who, who are the people that are sent to the ends of the earth? Us. Some of you are like, not me. I'm barely sent to the west of 270, bro. I ain't going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. <laughs> Listen, I, I hear you. I hear you. When you signed up to follow Jesus, you got involved in a global mission. And you are called by God to be a part of that, whether you see it or not. In fact, as the, the story of the Bible continues to unfold, God does begin to move in the church and he begins to say, the church, the people of God are gonna be a city on a hill. You don't hide that light. They're gonna be people that are gonna be a beacon. They're gonna be salt in the world, light in the world. They're gonna represent him. Jesus dies and he resurrects and he comes back and he's having one of his final talks with his men. And in that talk, he gives what we famously know as the Great Commission. The Great Commission that he was empowering to them, but empowering to us as disciples and followers of Jesus. And it's, a really important set of scriptures to know what our marching orders are. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Why 11? Because Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, had hung himself at this point. He's gone. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Conversation for another day. Crazy that a resurrected dude still has people doubting. Anyways, then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, all authority, everything from the Father has been given to me. And here's what I'm about to do. Ready? He's going to give the marching orders of the mission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go, and make, who, go, everybody go and make disciples of all nations. Now, what you're about to read in this passage is a bunch of verbs. Verbs that if you're familiar with this passage, you know, go, baptize, teach, all that stuff. But actually in the original language, there's only one verb in this entire story, in this entire uh, passage, and it's make disciples. What it literally says in the original language is as you are going, as you are doing your life, as you are going to soccer practice, as you are going to the coffee shop, as you are going to the mall, as you are going to the Buckeye game, as you are living your life, as you are going to work, you are to go and make disciples. That's what you're to do. Those are your marching orders of everybody. Everyone you come into contact with, you go, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God says the marching orders for the church of Jesus Christ is to go to every corner of the globe and reach people to the ends of the earth. That's the promise. That's the picture. And in between, a set apart people who go and do it. And Jesus was smart because he's like, I don't, I don't know that everybody always gets what I say the first time. So he says it again before he gets the sons of heaven. Just a little bit later in Acts chapter one, Jesus is having a conversation again, right before he's about to send to heaven. And he's talking to his people. And here's what he says in Acts chapter one. Then they gathered around him and they asked, Lord, <laughs> this is so funny. For 2000 years, people are always preoccupied with the same exact thing. It's called in theological terms, it's called eschatology. It's called end times. Everybody wants to know, when is Jesus going to come back and wreck shop and take up ownership of everything as KPC? Everybody's always interested. People text me, people email me all the time. When are you gonna preach about the end times? When are you gonna preach about the end times? And Jesus says what I wanna say to y'all. He looks and he says, uh, when are you gonna do this? And then he says to them, ready, as they keep going in the scripture, Lord, are you gonna go and restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the father is set by his own authority. Stop worrying about it. Stop being so obsessed about the end and be obsessed with the present. And here's what he says. Instead of worrying about when I'm gonna come back, what you should instead do is put your mind on what? And here's what he tells them, ready? But 
Instead, what you all should be thinking about, disciples, is that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, where? In Jerusalem, where you live, to Judea, the surrounding areas, to Samaria, even bigger out, and all the way to the ends of the earth. Jesus says it's the same mission. What did I, what did I tell him back on that mountain? Hey, you're going to go into all the world, and you're going to make disciples. As you are going, make disciples. And where? To the ends of the earth. And don't worry, I'm with you. My strength is with you. My power is with you. My message is with you. Okay. Did we hear him? Did he really say to go to the whole world? Yeah, I think he did. Did he really say to go to the whole world? Jesus again. He's like, hey, hey, Jesus, when are you going to come back and set up your throne? Stop worrying about it. Instead, what you should do is know that wherever you go, you're going to be my what? You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to tell people about what you've seen and know about me. And where are you going to do that? Well, as you're going to do it, you're going to do it at work. And you're going to do it on vacation. And when you go somewhere further on vacation, and you're going to do it all over the globe. Who? All of us. All of us. Because the why is that God is over and for the nations. But the call to the church, to you and to I, is simply this. That God's call is to reach all. That God's call is to reach all. That this is the great commission that is rooted in the great commandment, that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that God would get glory through the entire nations, that the world would be reached with the good news. This is the command of God to the church of, day, uh, church of today. And that we should all hear this and be driven to go, what's my part? God's call is to reach all. And there's two really significant things that are at stake. I mean, there's a ton of things that are at stake, but two really specific things that are at stake that I wanna highlight this weekend. Two things for what God says, this is, the, this is the promise, this is the picture, in between set apart people, God's call to us as followers of Jesus, if we are, is to reach everyone, to go into all the world. And he says, there's two things that are at stake that you need to understand. The, the first one that he wants to remind us is the uniqueness of Jesus. Remember in the psalm, it says that there is no God like you. You alone are God. Remember in Acts, it says that we're to be witnesses of Jesus. That we're to go and we're to make, we're to make disciples of Jesus. Please, please make, make, make this clearly understood. The mission of the church of Jesus Christ is, is not to go in the world and spread a religion. It's not to go into the world and spread the ways of our culture. It's not to colonialize people with some economic system. It's not to go make people moral. It's not to make people religious. That the call to reach all is to go into the world and to tell people about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. There's all these conversation these days about who's the goat at things. You know, the goat, the greatest of all time. So Tom Brady retired and people said, I see the goat. Is he the best of all time? Is he better than Joe Montana? Is he better than, is he the best of all time? Is he the goat? Just last year, I think it was in March or May, Jim Brown died. One of the few Cleveland Browns players who was good. <laughs> and a lot of people argued, is he the goat? Is he the best ever to play football? Just recently with the Olympics, we had Simone Biles. Is she the goat ever in women's gymnastics? I can't run into anyone under 30 who loves basketball who doesn't want to debate with me about the goat debate between LeBron and Jordan. If you don't say Jordan, you don't know Jesus. Clearly, you're wrong, okay? <laughs> so there's this ongoing debate over and over and over. I mean, especially, I get it. You know, LeBron's like 170 and he's still balling out. I get it. There's this debate all the time about who's the goat, who's the goat, who's the goat, who's the goat, who's the goat. Listen to me. When it comes to spiritual things and things of faith, there is not a discussion about who is the goat. You, you can talk about Muhammad, you can talk about Allah, you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about ancestors, you can talk about, you can talk about, you can talk about, ain't none of them Jesus. Jesus is unique. You can talk about Islam, you can talk about Buddhism, you can talk about Shintoism, you can talk about Scientology, you can talk about secularism, you can talk about any faith you want. None of them are the true Christian faith rooted in Jesus Christ. What is at stake in the world, listen to me, is the truth. 
And the truth is there is one way to heaven. There is one name that saves. There is one truth, one way, one life, and his name is Jesus. And if you don't know it, it's bad. And God has said, my, my picture is every tribe will know. And, and that's the promise. And the picture is that someday it'll happen. And between now and then, I'm calling a specific group of people, the church of Jesus Christ, to go into the world and make much of what? To be witnesses of what? To be witnesses of Jesus. We're not trying to pass on in the world grace fellowship methodology. We're not trying to pass on American Christianity. We're trying to pass on the truth that Jesus is the one and only God who is set apart from everybody else. And the mission that we've been called to be on is to make much of Jesus to the world. So in your own heart of hearts, do you believe that Jesus is not an option, but the option? Jesus isn't a good idea, he's the only idea. That Jesus is truly the name above all names, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess at his name. He is unique above all things. Do you believe that or not? Because the call to the ends of the earth is that we would go and make much of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. And that we would point people to Jesus and be witnesses of the one true God, and not just that we would tell people so people would show up in a church service and sing, that people would find out that their creator God is good and that his ways are better and human flourishing works more where he's at and that the world would be able to testify even to what the Queen of Sheba saw, that where God's blessing is, things are worth it in the uniqueness of Jesus. That's one thing that's at stake and God's call to reach all is he wants everyone to know Jesus is the only name that saved, that he didn't come to condemn, but he came to rescue. And the reason this matters is secondly, the thing that's so important is the eternal fate of people. I am, um, I'm not trying to be manipulative. I'm not trying to like guilt us. I'm not trying to shame us but I am trying to level set reality. As of January, 2024, statistics said about 8 billion people on planet earth. 8 billion people, 8 billion human souls. I was having a conversation with someone uh, last week and they asked me if I could ever dunk. And I said, I could, I can't now but I used to be able to dunk. And they were like, that's not true. And then they said an expression that they always say about athletics when people really can't jump. They say, you probably couldn't even jump over a phone book. Which like, this is an aside. Then I just started thinking about phone books. <laughs> and I was like, what a blast from the past. Some of you don't even know what a phone book is. Phone book, this giant book that you would see all over the place, just names of every person in a region, just name after name after name in alphabetical order. And then I started thinking about how there was a ministry when I was growing up where the way they showed the power of God was they ripped phone books in half. Some of you don't know nothing about that. But there was a ministry. And then I started thinking about, about where did phone books go and what do we do now and how does that play out? And, and, then, and then I paused and just, just like this, I mean this. And then I just started connecting the idea that there are name after 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 name in every phone book that ever existed. And listen to me, every single one of those people is gonna spend eternity in either heaven or hell. Your neighbors, heaven or hell. Your coworkers, heaven or hell. Your friends, heaven or hell. Your kids, heaven or hell. All of us, heaven or hell. What is at stake in every part of the world in every corner of the earth is the eternal fate of people. It's obviously on my mind with sending my kid to college that, that I'm reminded that some of us spend more energy and time focusing on where our kid will spend four or five years ago to college than if they're actually going to go and be with Jesus in heaven. And the call of the Christian is to go to the ends of the earth for the uniqueness of Jesus, but also for the eternal fate of people. 
Some of you say, are you seriously telling me, Keith, that people who never have heard the name of Jesus will go to hell? They've never heard about God. They've never been given a chance. And you're like, that's unfair. First of all, whole separate conversation. You're determining fairness based on a system that God created, which if there is no God, then that's a whole different thing. But you're basing that on that. Second thing is my God is good. I'm not worried about his justice measures. He's gonna get it right. But here's what I know. If the best way for people to go to heaven is for us to never tell them, we should all just shut up. If people are actually okay because they don't know, then none of us should ever talk about this. The best thing we should do is just all be quiet and never proclaim the name of Jesus. Then everybody will be safe because nobody knows. But the Bible says this in Romans chapter one, every single person is without excuse. That creation and conscience declare that God is real. Listen, I don't want a single person to go to hell. I'm not rooting for that. But what I am saying is this is real and every single person in every part of the world is gonna go there. And so what has God said? I wanna call out a special group of people who will know me and follow me and love me and they will go to the ends of the earth for me. And God's call is to reach all. Why? Because Jesus is unique and because every single person has an eternal soul that'll spend somewhere either with God or without God. And I trust the character of God and how he's gonna navigate that. Now, I said to you, this is like part one. There's a whole, you know, couple more weeks we got to deal with. But here's what I want to start to do to awaken the external and eternal eyes in our mind about this, that the call of God is to reach all. As the homework assignment that I want to ask you to do, if you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you can do this. But if you're a Christian, I, I really want to ask you to do this, is this. I want you to go download this app. It's, it's an app called Unreached of the Day. It's an app that's put out by the Joshua Project, which is an organization that tracks unreached people groups all over the world, does things with global missions and reaching people to the ends of the earth. And what this shows you every single day is a people group in the world that has not yet received the gospel at a number that it's considered reached. I said earlier, there's 8 billion people on the planet. Statistically speaking, the people groups that are unreached represent 3.4 billion people who do not know the gospel. 3.4 3.4 billion people. And what I've found is since I've had this on my phone, a number of years ago, someone recommended it to me, is every day I just pull this up and I look and, and it gives you a picture of people from this people group. It gives you like a summary about some of the things. It tells you where these people are. You can pull up a map. But what it just awakens in me is that the world needs Jesus. And it awakens prayer in me. It awakens the idea that we're called, that we're all supposed to go to the ends of the earth and that we're all supposed to be mindful of this. So just put this on your phone and every day just take a couple minutes and look at it and go, oh my gosh, there's this people group in this part of Monaco, this part of Morocco, this part of the 1040 window does not know Jesus and the call is to reach all. Now I know this, I know this. I've been around church a long time. Some of you hear this and you're like, man, this is like, this sounds like the, the grown-up Christian faith. Like this is for the Navy SEAL Christians. And I, I love you, I love you, but I just, I just, I just wanna just say this, like this is like the baseline, guys. Let me, let, me, let me put it to you this way. The God's global call is not an option for the disciple of Jesus. It's not an option. It's not like an add-on that it's like, ah, I'll upgrade Every single follower of Jesus is called to impact the ends of the earth. Every one of us. And I know, how, what am I supposed to do next week? But here's what I want you to wrestle with this weekend. Do you believe that? That God's global call is not an option for you if you're a follower of Jesus. You know, there's a... There's a point in conversations and in debates and arguments and discussions where someone says something and if what they said is true, then the implications of that are far reaching. Like if that's true, then I should sell my house. If that's true, I should go to bed at a different time. If that's true, I should move. If that's true, I should pull all my money out of that and put it into that. If that's true, I should stop doing that with my kids. If that's true, I should eat that. If that's true, there's implications. If the promise of God is that every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be reached and the picture of God is that's what happens at the end and the plan of God is God's called out people and it's the church. And if you're a Christian, you're a part of the church. If all that's true, then what does that really mean for you? 
And I asked the question earlier, do you care? Do you dream about it? Do you think about it? Do you pray about it? Do you give towards it? Do you share towards it? Do you journey towards it? How do you engage the fact that God's call is to indeed reach all? Are you participating in the ends of the earth movement? (laughs) People have um, accused me at times as a preacher of being too excitable, too passionate. Some people have said you're too intense. And I do my best to lovingly look back at them and say, if I'm not gonna be intense and passionate about this, I don't know what I should be intense and passionate about. We are talking about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sin of the world, the good shepherd, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is before all things, the one who will always be, the one who is so glorious that someday in the new heavens and new earth, there's no need for the sun because Jesus radiates his glory. We're talking about him. And we're talking about the reality of every person we will ever look at face to face or that has ever walked the earth where they will spend eternity. If that doesn't fire you up, I don't, I, I don't know that you know the same Jesus I do. Because he is the name above all names, the name to where every name will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord and he is the only name that can save. And his call is to reach all and his plan is the church. Let me pray for us. Father, it's, um, it's just an amazing thing that you want relationship with us to begin with. You, you don't need us, but you want us. And you have, man, you literally came to earth to get us. And you've been calling and drawing people to respond and repent to represent you so that people would know you. And now it's our turn to go to the ends of the earth. God, would you stir in us as followers of Jesus external and eternal eyes for the world. And for those who don't know you, would you just stir in them who you are, the uniqueness of Jesus that is unlike and unparalleled to any. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.